Hello, welcome to the Hope, Health, and Healing Podcast. I am Michelle Hannah Fields, and I am your host for episode 23, where I am joined by my friend, Blake Russell. This is actually part one of a two-part series where he shares his story. He grew up in a normal, middle-class family and played baseball throughout his youth and his high school. He actually was playing on a college baseball team on a full scholarship when his life took a different turn. He shares how he was introduced to alcohol and drugs as a freshman in high school and just how he continued making choices um, that led him down the wrong path. This path he was on started with just experimenting with a little marijuana testing a little alcohol and then continuing down that path and Blake shares how he didn't just wake up one day and say this is the day I become a drug addict and this is the day that I go to prison it wasn't like that for Blake it was just daily choices that took him down that path until he found himself on a five-year prison sentence so sit back relax with your favorite cup of coffee or beverage of your choice and listen as Blake shares part one of his story. So I'm joined today by my friend Blake Russell and so Blake and I met in 2014. Mm -hmm. I had just started going to Evangel. I was single and I was looking for a life group Mm -hmm. and I heard that there was this singles life group that was started and i go and and i'm the oldest one there (laughs) maybe i think chris cloud was in there we're about the same age and there was all of you young people in there Mm -hmm. and but you and jesse Mm -hmm. and was and chris were the the leaders of that life group and and i just learned so much just sitting under your teaching Mm -hmm. and was just drawn to um not just your story because you have a powerful story but how god changed your life and i saw that in you and knew you know sometimes you when you see somebody you know they've got it and it's real right and that's what i saw in you so thank you for coming on to share your story today it's a pleasure to be here thank you So, Blake, tell us a little bit about who you are and just where where your life began and kind of just your journey. Yeah. Well, Blake Russell, like you said, I'm from here, uh, born and raised right here in Phoenix City where we sit, not too far actually from where we are. Um, Normal childhood, you know, kind of middle, upper class, you know, neighborhoods and normal upbringing uh, graduated from central high school in 2001 went to college and played baseball on college uh, on baseball scholarships went to two colleges uh, ultimately got kicked out of both of them you know we'll get into that but yeah normal guy from right here in the southeast and uh, would eventually go on and do about eight years in prison just drug abuse and drug sales and distribution uh, met the Lord in 2012 in prison uh, my second prison term and that's when everything changed literally everything about my life changed the way I thought the way I looked at life my visions my goals my aspirations the the desires everything changed that year in that moment Uh, got out in 2013 Um, yeah got almost immediately into ministry some form of it whether it was just Bible studies or street Mm -hmm. ministry or sharing my testimony Uh, met my wife uh, in 2016 but it was didn't meet her kind of met her for the second time she was also my childhood high school sweetheart Mm -hmm. that i went 13 years without even seeing uh just randomly ran into her on the streets of atlanta Mm -hmm. Uh, that was 2016 and now we're married and been married for seven years got two kids uh live right up the road here and yeah owned a couple businesses uh do ministry and landscape work travel uh, uh, locally, regionally, nationally, internationally, share the gospel, and mm-hmm. yeah, been walking with the Lord for 12 years. That's awesome. I'm just so proud of you just mm-hmm. for where you've got, 
come from and, and what you're doing and how you pour it into others. So talk about, I know you had this um, aspiring baseball career. So right. talk about that, like what was that like in as a youth and growing up because mm -hmm. so many young boys that's their dream so right, talk about right. that a little bit yeah that was my dream growing up uh, if you would have asked me pretty much from the time I was old enough to realize like I really like baseball like you know when you're in t-ball and coach pitch you're just kind of doing it the other kids mm -hmm. are doing it but I think around the age of probably 12 13 uh, not to say that I realized I was good but you just kind of step into where it becomes like a lifestyle mm -hmm. you're watching all the games you're wanting to go and see all the big kids play and you're wearing all the cool baseball gear you got to have the coolest glasses and the cleats and the gloves and so i did that from you know i played baseball baseball from the time i was four all the way up to like i said i was about i think i was 19 maybe 20 when i quit playing but yeah it was life it was life i mean i was identified as a baseball player uh always patted on the back my teenage years high school just for being kind of a, a top tier athlete uh, when it come to baseball and it was life uh, I, I talk to kids now pretty much if not weekly at least monthly uh, to schools or fca meetings or big groups of uh, athletes and i i ask them uh, you know when you're not playing sports and you're not playing baseball anymore what are you who are you what are you going to be and none of them really can ever answer that because they're so locked in just like I was I mean if you would have told me when I was 15 or 16 you know you're not going to play baseball forever I'd have been like you didn't play baseball forever but <laughs> I'm going to do this you know yeah. so yeah it was a big part of my childhood growing up it was pretty much my identity mm -hmm. that's the only thing I knew I didn't know the Lord uh, mm -hmm had good parents but we didn't go to church you know so mm -hmm. I didn't I was a baseball player that was mm -hmm. it and uh, when it was taken from me kind of you know by my own choices uh, I kind of I went into really not knowing who I was mm -hmm. I look back now you can always look back in hindsight's 2020 but yeah baseball was life uh, there was no way I wasn't going to do anything but it mm -hmm. if you'd asked me in those teenage years yeah so where did you kind of get off track Mm -hmm. in life well growing up I was a normal kid I mean I, I did things got in trouble you know we, mm -hmm. we did stuff uh, just like every kid does even good kids you know mm -hmm. um, but you test the limits for sure yeah you know you test the limits I, I remember just little stuff you mm -hmm. know coming home later than I should ride my bike farther than I was told I could ride it mm -hmm. uh, but not anything I see a lot of stuff these days because I'm in ministry, especially with the youth. I see a lot of stuff, and I'm like, wow. Like, these kids are so far, farther gone and farther immersed in the things than I ever thought about. Like, At the a younger age. Uh, yeah, the stuff yeah. they're doing actually scared me when I, I was like, no way. You know, I still had some kind of fear for authority. Mm -hmm. They just don't have it. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I was 13, I smoked uh, my first joint, my first marijuana, uh, mm -hmm. you know, joint when I was 13 in a group of big kids uh, ironically playing basketball playing a sport there was nine of us and one of the older kids had a joint that his older brother had given him and uh, we walked around the back of a house and they fired it up and I'm just I remember dribbling the basketball thinking okay here my buddies are, I guess we're going back here to do whatever they're gonna do and uh, when it came around in the rotation to me I just hit it uh, and I remember that was the kind of the beginning of the addiction uh it was also my first year when i was 13 that i drank alcohol mm -hmm. at a, another sporting event uh a big shawl uh, high school and central high school football game at connect stadium i was a freshman a young freshman i was a 13 year old freshman mm -hmm. and i rode with a bunch of seniors uh mm -hmm. already hanging out with upperclassmen and so that's where it kind of started uh, i was introduced you know kind of some of my innocence was taken at that moment and then uh, it just progressed over the next six or seven years. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever just, you know, they used to say that marijuana was the gateway drug, and I think some, some people now kind of deny that, but it definitely is. I mean, nobody wakes up and says, you know, I've never done drugs before, and today's the day I become like a cocaine addict mm -hmm. or a meth addict or a heroin mm -hmm. addict. It always opens up with alcohol and weed, mm -hmm. and so that's how it happened with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that because mm -hmm. I've seen it in other people's lives Yeah, that that's, that's where it starts because, you know, those will make you feel good for a little while. Right. But then when your body gets used to that, 
you've got to have something a little oh, yeah. stronger and a little stronger and it's oh, yeah. just it's a progression then yeah definitely is uh, and it's 10 out of 10 every case I've ever saw I mean there are some extreme cases where kids or young adults like their first taste of anything uh, like that is it's like a higher level drug but most of the time it's mm -hmm. it's weed or alcohol or a, you know a pill or something mm -hmm. that's really accepted and not expensive right you know and so that's how mine was and uh, I did it all of my high school years uh, I did get a DUI when I was 16 but it was almost like one of those DUIs that you know the kids are just hanging out having fun their car pulled into a party and I just happened to have the beer and been drinking kind of a I mean my parents made a fuss about it and some of the coaches were like we need to get a, a grip on him but not enough to be like whoa maybe he's got a real problem mm -hmm. you know just kind of a Blake got caught we all did it but not everybody gets caught but you yeah. got caught kind of deal yeah. but what they didn't know is uh there's a whole bunch more I was doing mm -hmm. and being an athlete uh, I tell athletes all the time it's going to be a little tougher for you. You're going to be introduced to things a little bit quicker because you are the kings and the queens of the school. You're the mm -hmm. you're the kids that most kids look up to, the athletes, mm -hmm. because you're getting more of the accolades, the administration, the teachers, the coaches, the newspapers, people around town are patting you on the back because you are the stars of an event that the whole town comes to watch. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to be introduced to it more. Uh, I was introduced to it quicker. Um, you know, 13, weed and alcohol. By 15, it was uh, X pills and more weed and, you know, Adderall, um, Xanax. And then by 16, 17, it was, it was cocaine. It was acid. It was more ecstasy, uh, more drinking. It was really partying. And then after baseball, it was even harder drugs. But those baseball years, I did, I did drugs. I smoked weed heavy, heavily. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would smoke weed pulling up to Darnell Field right up the road here to pitch in a playoff game and I would I would be putting a blunt out in my ashtray in my Camaro or in my Mazda MX-6 and I would go out there and pitch a game wow. you know higher than a kite mm -hmm. and you just did it it was like like now like I you know alcoholics they just drink beer and they don't even think about it you mm -hmm. know they, I, just, I just did it mm -hmm. and I never would have said well I have a problem I didn't know the Lord mm -hmm. and I didn't really have a standard of a man saying hey you know somebody telling me look this is the road I had coaches telling me if you don't if you don't slow down after the fact you're going to go to jail or prison but nobody in the moment to say hey you're me 10 years ago this is where right. you're going and yeah. the, the road is inevitable mm -hmm. um, but so yeah drugs and alcohol was a big part of my childhood it was a big part of the baseball and so when it ultimately caught up with me I was arrested at a buddy's house uh, I had a pretty good amount of weed in my pocket and Metro Narcotics agents had been watching the house, him and his father, for cocaine distribution and uh, they just happened to do the bust and I was in the garage uh, just there, just there to pick somebody up and go to the fair and I just happened to be there when they did the bust and mm -hmm. so I got arrested. Mm -hmm. um, marijuana with, the, with possession with the intent to distribute and got kicked out of college I think the next day and uh, got put on probation and just never recovered from there. Mm -hmm. Never reported. Uh, was always in and out of jail for like the next year, year and a half on violation of probations. I, I couldn't go take a urinalysis test for my probation officer because I'm never clean. So baseball just faded. It just, it just started. And I remember having the thought when I was 19, 20, well, if I could just, I just need to get my act together and I can go back and play baseball. Mm -hmm. you know? But it just kept fading like a boat going away from the dock. Mm -hmm. And before I knew it, you know, I'm eight years in prison and baseball is long gone. Mm -hmm. Or I'm four years in prison and baseball is long gone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it happened quick, but the the progression leading into it was six or seven years. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I remember, you know, the last, people ask me, do you remember the last game you played in? I remember uh, I was pitching in a tournament in Gadsden, Alabama, and it was on a Sunday. I remember I struck out a lot of batters that game. I can't remember. I get it mixed up because it's been so long ago. I don't know if I struck out eight or if I struck out 13. If I pitched eight innings and struck out 13, the numbers are kind of mm -hmm. splotchy in my memory. But it's a really good game and had uh, Brave Scouts and Anaheim Angel Scouts and Florida Marlins Scouts and Kansas City Royal Scouts. And they were all outside the dugout talking to me as I walked out. And uh, I was, you know, 91, 92 in the later innings and 
just commanding every pitch I threw and had a really good outing, probably high before the game, probably smoked a blunt before I got on the bus. And I remember the two Brave Scouts specifically said, hey, we have we watched you. We came actually to watch another guy throw, and we you caught our eye, and we're very interested in uh, – we're going to probably try to take you in the in the draft the next year, and you know they had like rookie ball where you get drafted and you don't immediately go up to the bigs or mm-hmm. even in the double A or triple A, but you go into like a rookie ball league. And they, uh, I remember them specifically saying, "Hey, this time next year, you got a chance to be making some good money playing baseball. Is that what you want to do, or do you want to continue out in college?" And I was like, "No, man." I don't, I don't want to go to school anymore. I'm ready to get drafted. And they said, well, look, go to class. Do everything your coaches say. Continue to do what you're doing. Keep your nose clean. I remember them. I remember the one guy specifically saying that, the one pro scout. He's like, hey, keep your nose clean and stay out of trouble, you know, and the f- future looks bright for you. And that was on a Sunday, and uh, that Tuesday is where I, was, I got arrested. Wow. Kicked out of college Wednesday. So within, like, mm-hmm. 72 hours, just boom. Mm. You know, but never thought about it. Never thought it would catch up the way it did. And even when I got arrested, I remember my coach telling me, why don't you just come live with me? He's like, I've got to release you from the team because a student athlete cannot catch a felony and remain on scholarship. I've got to pull your scholarship, but next spring I can give it back to you. Why don't you come? This was in the fall. This was around September. So why don't you just come move in with me for eight months, Blake? Just live with me and my wife and our newborn kid and... In eight months, you're out of here. You're going to get drafted. You're out of Phoenix City and Columbus. You're out of this area, and you're going to go play pro ball probably the rest of your life. And I remember telling Coach Thomas, Adam Thomas, he's the coach at Pacelli now, I remember saying, no, Coach, I'm good. And the only thing I was thinking was, man, I got, like, freedom. I don't have to go to school. I just got kicked out of school. I don't have to go to practice. I've been going to practice and playing baseball for almost 20 years now. I can take six months and do what I want to do. You know, I can party is really what I was thinking. I can mm-hmm. party and sleep all day and just have, and baseball, is, and when I get ready, when I get it out of my system, I'll just go back and play baseball. Mm-hmm. And I told him, Coach, I'm going to take a little break. Let me get my mind together, collect my thoughts, just some bogus response that all kids give. But there's always a motive behind their mm-hmm. shallow response, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I would violate probation over the next six months, two or three times. to do a month in the county jail, two months in the county jail, and then, ultimately go to prison for the first time and do 15 months. So, mm-hmm. that's, I mean, it all happened pretty quick, but at the yeah. same time, it was about a six or seven year progression. Yeah. Yeah. During your first prison um, sentence, what was that like for you? And did that kind of make you reflect back and think, wow, like I've got to change something? Not the first one. Mm-hmm. The second one did. I was older. The first one was, I, when I tell my testimony in front of you know churches or athletes, <laughs> I went in at 21 or 22. I want to say I got arrested when I was 19. So I would kind of, I, I think I must have been 22 years old when I went the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, still super immature mentally. I don't know if I was just immature boy, you know, or if the drugs had, but I just did not have a, maybe I was just a normal 22 year old, I don't know. But uh, that first prison sentence for me was kind of easy. And I tell you, it was kind of a cakewalk. Um, mm-hmm. I was an athlete going in. I was 6'4", 185 pounds. So right, I remember pulling up to the back gate of that prison, which is Kilby Correctional Facility, which is a really big prison. I think it may be the biggest in the state of Alabama because it has all the processing counties that bring their inmates there. I remember standing at the back gate thinking, wow, I'm in prison. But automatically, like, just by impulse, you go into, like, how can I network this? And and like get the best out of it that's my mindset a lot of guys don't a lot of guys think how can i survive mm-hmm. my mindset was like man how am i because i'm a people person i'm a sociable person I, I can't sit when i go to the orthodontist i sit in a room and there's like 20 people all on their phones i'm like somebody talk to me you know <laughs> yeah. you know like I, i'm just like that so prison was like that and i gravitated to wherever there was a ball basketball court i was there the volleyball court throwing horseshoes with the older guys anything competitive i just always have you know went towards that and i did it in prison so i networked a lot like i met a lot more drug dealers than i ever knew out here on the street Mm. you know guys originally from texas colorado california florida that were doing time for like trafficking a lot of drugs um and so when i came out after doing 15 months i was 22 23 
And I remember I went back to my dad's house and tried to do good for like a year. I worked with him. He's a general contractor. And I just hated it. You know, getting up every day, going to do construction work, making like $400 a week. I was just like, what? A, it's awful. I'm watching all my drug dealing buddies making, they're making $400 for 8 o'clock in the morning. And I remember I made the thought. I mean, I, I, I kind of like what Jesus said. Uh, I read this in the gospel. Jesus said, you know, who doesn't first sit down and count the cost? I remember making that. Just, I counted the cost in darkness, though, not the way he said do it. Mm -hmm. But I remember I was at my dad's house one day, and I just wanted to party. I just wanted to get out. I, I just didn't want structure. And uh, I remember I thought, if that's the worst they can do to me, then I'm going to just go back to the streets. Like if I if I go out here and sell all kind of drugs or do drugs or if I something happens and I end up taking a man's life or I kill, that's the worst they can do to me. Mm -hmm. Send me to prison. I remember thinking the state has pulled their trump card, like they have pulled their wild card, and like this is what we got for you if you don't straighten up. And that was easy. Mm -hmm. That was actually now at 15 months. I didn't have to do years, but I remember thinking that was. And so I, I said, all right, let's do it. I left my dad's house, him and my stepmom crying, knowing I was going back to the streets. Um, and it wasn't too long after that I was I was back locked up. But that first prison run was, I always call prison, uh, it's kind of like LinkedIn for inmates. It's LinkedIn for criminals. Because mm -hmm. you go there and you meet, you just network. And that's mm -hmm. what the first prison term was for me. It was networking. Mm -hmm. So. When did you get involved in the gangs in Columbus? Mm -hmm. Well, this, so I, I did that 15 months. I got out. I was out, like I said, for about a year and did right. And then I left my dad's house. I would do six months in Muskogee County from running from the police out in Casita. Had a whole bunch of drugs on me. Threw it out the window. They didn't see it. Um, but they did get me for running. And so I did six months for that. Then I got out for three months, and I would go back and do five years and 39 days. On that second prison term for trafficking methamphetamine uh, from 2005, I mean 2008 to 2013, is when I became I became a gang member in 2000. And, I want to say it was January of 2010. Might have been 2009. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, and I became a gang member. I became a member of the Latin Kings. Now I'm a white guy. So people think, well, how do you how are you a Latin king? Well, uh, the Latin kings are one organization. There's multiple out there, but they'll take on any nationality. But you can only get to a certain rank in authority if you have Hispanic blood in you. And so I knew that going in. But a lot of my close buddies inside that prison that I did three years in were Latin kings. So I became a Latin king, uh, and that enabled me to traffic more drugs. I became a drug trafficker in prison not on the street I was never a drug dealer on the street I was just a drug user who kept a pretty good amount of drugs on me for party for the party scene and girls and whatnot but I would have never I was never the guy that sat around and like took phone calls and like made drug deals mm -hmm. you know until I went to prison like prison helped me become a drug dealer and so I became a gang member and then a drug dealer and uh, yeah I, I was a, a Latin king for hard Latin King for about two and a half years where I gang banged and got in you know ran with just my brothers and and did that and so when I came home in 2013 you know I had that gang background and so doing gang street ministry is kind of easy for me because I know the language I know the verbiage I know how to identify I know how not to step on toes or offend or when is it safe when is it not type mm -hmm. deal so mm -hmm. All that from prison. That that young thirteen year old right. kid from the north side of Phoenix City. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Never. And I tell people, I tell gang members now that I know I'm talking to in the jails and the prisons. Like, look, I'm not I'll be the first to I didn't grow up on the south side, I didn't grow up in the hood. Like I I chose that lifestyle. A lot of them are born into that. Mm -hmm. like, they don't have a shot coming out of the womb. They really mm -hmm. don't. The cars are stacked against them. Like but I chose it. I chose it because mm -hmm. the sexiness of it. Mm -hmm. and the authority that came with it mm -hmm. and so yeah and you know i think there's a couple of things i think about is one thing pastor paul always say mm -hmm. satan will um take you farther where you, you want to go, go uh, keep you longer than, than you, you want to stay, stay. Yeah. and it'll cost you a whole lot more, more than you you're willing to pay, to pay. yeah that's it <laughs> and you know i think that that's what i see you know when your story is you you know when you first started out it's just a little 
a little Play hit around. on weed, yep. a little drink here and there, a lot of fun, you know, seeing the upperclassmen doing this, it's cool, I'm going to do it, and then it just progresses, and Satan just takes you down into this deep, dark hole, and, you know, when you, um, when you started with the gang in, in prison, I kind of want to take you back to what your mindset was mm -hmm. there. Yeah. What what was the mindset that made you think, like, I'm going to do this? Mm -hmm. You know, were you looking for, were you looking for um, approval? Were you looking for status? Mm -hmm. What was, what was it that you were looking for? We yeah. all know that the answer was God the whole yeah. time. Yeah. That's what you were seeking. But what was it that you were seeking that you were like, wow, this is what's going to fill that void right. in my life? Yeah, looking back uh, subconsciously in that moment, in that season of life, I wouldn't have said that I'm looking for anything or, you know, status or whatever. But now looking back, like, I remember the family aspect of the Latin Kings especially and most what I see in most Hispanic gangs or Hispanic people by nature they are very family oriented and they yeah. it, was, it was a big thing that La Familia the family um, and so there was that but also uh, I remember having the mindset that this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life mm -hmm. and so now looking back I was probably in a state of deep depression but it was masked with drugs and rage and Popularity, even in the prison, you know, I, everybody knew who I was. The guards, the administration, the warden, everybody. Um, but I remember thinking, not too long after I became a, a gang member, and even before that, like, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. Like, I've chosen this. Like, I'm going to come to prison. I'm going to do these five years. I'm going to get out. I'm going to sell drugs. I may never get caught, but I'm probably going to get caught again. I'm going to come back do five to ten more years. And you just accept that's your lot in life, you know. Uh, I would look at, I had a cell phone in prison that was illegal, but I had one. I had multiple cell phones. And I was on Facebook, you know, under an alias a lot of times, so the administration and the prison officials wouldn't see it. But I remember watching, like, all my peers, some of the guys I grew up with doing drugs, that it kind of it faded out of their life. And they're, uh, they're graduating from Alabama or Auburn or Troy or Columbus State or or some of them are signing, you know, the mortgages on their first homes or getting married or their first child is on the way. And I remember just like looking at this stuff and vicariously living through other people's lives, watching all my friends and then thinking, what am I doing? You know, I'm in prison. I'm a gang member. I'm a drug user. And then that would just fuel. Like this is, like my anger from watching people succeed would just be like, no, this is my lot in life. This is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and I had accepted it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got to the point, like probably 2010, all the way to all the way up to when I got saved, uh, late October of 2012. I wasn't. I was never suicidal. I never sat around thinking, uh, I just need to die. Mm -hmm. I just need to take myself out, put myself out of my misery. But I remember having the thoughts, like almost like a kamikaze suicidal. Like if I die from whatever happens, from the life I've chosen, I just die. If I kill somebody, they just die. You know, I remember having those thoughts, and now I look back and like, man, what a dark hole. Mm -hmm. Not suicidal, but, I mean, kamikaze pilots are suicidal. Mm -hmm. but they're not waking up every day going, how can I kill myself today? They just do it for the cause kind of mm -hmm. deal. And so, yeah, being a gang member and a drug user, an intravenous drug user, um, I would have thoughts of, like, how did I get here? You know, but then they would be immediately pushed out with, don't think like that. Just push the pedal to the floor and just go. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody cares anyway. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And I, I think, you know, it, it does put you in that deep, dark place. And, you know, sometimes you feel like there's no other way. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. there's there's no other way to live. And then sometimes the enemy will tell you you're better off than those people anyway. Right. That, right. that you're seeing. Right. You know, have this success. Look at you. What you you've got all this power and control. Yeah. You got all these people who know you and mm -hmm. want to be you. 
Yeah. And I think that too, you know, fuels that sometimes. Yeah, I tell kids a lot when I speak in schools, especially the alternative schools or the kids that are really in trouble. I tell them, don't take the bait. And you've already took some of it. And, you know, the bait that I took was, I can do this. I can live this life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you can come back to prison. You can keep getting that. I, I had told myself that. Like, I'm going to get out. I'm going to do good for a little while. I'm going to have as much fun as I can. I'm going to get as high as I can. I'm going to make as much money as I can. But I'm going to come back. Mm -hmm. And that's the bait. Why? Because you can. Mm -hmm. Like, I tell these kids all the time, like, you can go to prison and you can do it. You're not going to die. I mean, the percentage of you getting killed in prison, well, now, Alabama has more murders state prison than any other state but it's very very low percentage the catch is you can live this life and you can keep doing it and you don't die mm -hmm. you know and even most drug addicts you know don't take the bait of mm -hmm. this is my life because mm -hmm. it's actually a, a plot to kill you mm -hmm. whether you die physically or you die spiritually and you never make an impact in this world mm -hmm. you just you know the wages of sin are death mm -hmm. and so I took the bait mm -hmm. you know but uh, by the grace of the Lord I, yeah. you know, came out of it. Yeah. Talk about that, you know, just to tra transition from, you mm -hmm. know, you've lived this life. That's what you were wanting to do. How did God get a hold of you? Yeah. Well, uh, 2012, April 22nd of 2012, it was about 4 o'clock in the morning. And I, w I got awakened by uh, about nine officers at State and Correctional Facility, which is in Elmore County, Montgomery. And uh, I remember thinking, when I woke up, I sat up on my rack. I had a top rack. I had a bunk mate that was sleeping up under me. And I was in a bay with about 120 other inmates, but in a dorm that had about 500 inmates. And um, they were all standing around my rack. And I remember thinking they'd come to get my cell phone again. You know, mm -hmm. so I remember I sat up on my rack, and I said some choice words to them, and came out of my boxers with my cell phone and handled my cell phone. And... And they were like, you know, yeah, we're taking that. We're going to get whatever else you got right here. But this is not why we're here. You're on transfer. And I remember thinking, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning, scratching my head, like, I'm on transfer. And they're like, yep, you're on a C-51. And that's a C-51 lateral transfer where you get transferred. Initially, all it is is essentially is they, they swap out inmates. They take one inmate from one prison and one inmate from another prison that is causing problems in those prisons, and they just swap you out across the state. They're just changing your atmosphere, changing your environment. And so uh, that's what they did to me that day. And I went to Easterling Correctional Facility, which is in Clio, Alabama, which is about, I'd say probably about an hour away from Montgomery. It's about an hour and 20 minutes away from here. And I remember when I pulled up at the back gate of Easterling, uh, I was just like, no, not Easterling. Because there's three prisons in that area mm -hmm. that you could go to. And uh, Easterling was the only tobacco-free institution. Out of 33 institutions, 32 male institutions, only one female prison in Alabama, Easterling was the only one at the time that was tobacco-free. They did not sell cigarettes or dip or anything on the store. And I had smoked Newports for 16 years. I remember thinking, no. You know, and Easterling was also known as an observation camp. So it was kind of like a more strict run camp. It was where all the tough guys and the hot boys and all the drug dealers went. And so they put me in lockup my first 30 days there. I did 30 days in lockup. But what happened during that lockup span, um, I was 28 at the time, is I got sober. Because I could always get drugs on the street, I could always get drugs in jail, and I could always get drugs in the prison. But they sent me here, and I was in lockup. And I'd done stints in lockup, seven days here, 14 days there, but not enough to really get clean. Is that like solitary yeah, confinement? Yeah, right. And I didn't know anybody at the prison, so I couldn't get a runner or another inmate to smuggle me something in there. Now, other guys knew that I was there, because when I got out, they greeted me like, and it was guys I'd done time with at other camps or whatever, been mm -hmm. at Staten with me. But I got sober for 30 days since I was 13 years old. Wow. Like my body was free of toxins. Mm -hmm. And I remember for whatever reason, Michelle, I got out, I walked around the compound, the prison, I met up with some old buddies that I knew that were there. And I could have got high, I could have smoked a joint. They didn't have a lot of like um, speed there. They didn't have like cocaine and methamphetamines, which was my drugs of choice. I was always a speed guy, never a downer. Never a heroin or a suboxone or a methadone. Nothing ever slowed me down. 
and they just didn't have it there. They had some other stuff. But I remember I made the decision. I had a couple guys ask me, hey, do you want to make a run? Do you want to put together something? We have a route, which means if you want to get some drugs up here, we can get it in. Mm -hmm. And I, for whatever reason, I just said, no, let me just, let me just chill for about a month. Let me look at the layout of the land, which means let me watch how the prisons run. Let me identify the snitches. Let me identify what guards are okay, what are not. Let me watch the prison for about a month and kind of get mm -hmm. intel, mm -hmm. essentially is what it is. And I just didn't get high. And in that month, though, I got back on the weight pile. I gained about 30 pounds in like two or three months of muscle and was just feeling different about myself. My mind was sober and... Uh, and, and clear. I, and clear. <laughs> now I was still gangbanging. I was still mm -hmm. doing the stuff, but I was not high. Mm -hmm. That was a big deal. For, mm -hmm. You know, you're talking 16 years since I was 13. Imagine the... Yeah, the man, all the stuff I'd missed out on, and so I, I just didn't get high. And then it was October of that same year, roughly six months later, uh, Jeremy Boone. I'll never forget him. I don't know what he's doing now. He might be back in prison. I don't know where he's at. But he's from Valley, Alabama, and uh, Jeremiah Boone. We called him Jeremy. I, play, I was playing basketball with him one day, and he said, man, why don't you come to chapel with me? And he had just recently, I think, gotten saved, maybe a month. And, you know, our new friends, they get saved. They're mm -hmm. very zealous for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he was like, come to chapel. And I was like, I don't know, man. You know, I've been in prison for probably three and a half years at this point, done, done roughly six years. And uh, I was like, man, I ain't never been in a chapel. I'd been in a chapel before, but it was always to do deals. Mm. You go in there and you can talk and you can whisper. You know? mm. The guards are not going to come up and be like, are you, what are y'all talking about? We mm -hmm. can just always say, we're praying. Mm -hmm. And so I went to chapel that night with him. Didn't feel anything. I don't even remember what the guy preached on. Uh, definitely didn't raise my hand to get saved. Mm -hmm. And I was walking back to my dorm, and he was like, are you coming tomorrow, man? We can meet up there. They do prayer calls and all this stuff. And I was like, I don't know, man. I'll let you know. You know? I kind of just went because my buddy asked me to go. But what did happen that night is I went back to my dorm, and I remember I was in between books. I would get books ordered in, and I was in between the John Gotti biography, the Teflon Don out of New York, the Mafia boss. Mm -hmm. I had just read his whole life story, and I was waiting on the Sammy the Bull Gravano, his hitman biography, to come in. Mm -hmm. And I was in between books, and I had no book to read. And there was other books I could get, John Grisham, Dean Koontz, you know, books I could have read, but I had this old Joyce Meyer, Battlefield of the Mind book. Oh, yeah, I love that book. And my mom had sent it to me like four years earlier. Mm -hmm. And I had this old big New King James Bible that this old preacher man had given me in the county jail before I even started this prison bid when I was waiting to go to prison. Now, how those two books made it through all the lockup cells, all the guards tossing my rack and searching my stuff, and I, I don't know how those two books made it through. Yeah. It was a miracle. Yeah. Because like, I had done a lot of moving and shake. I had thrown stuff away and books away, but I, maybe I kept the Bible because there was some kind of reverence. Like, that's the Bible. Mm -hmm. And maybe I would kept the battlefield of mine because my mom gave it to me. Mm -hmm. So it was like a sentimental yeah. thing. So I started reading that Joyce Meyer book and just got just captivated by it. You know, and that was the first first gospel readings or anything I'd ever read. Like, I didn't really read the Bible. But like when she was talking about Second Peter or, or where James says, you know, the tongue is like the rudder of a ship. I remember it was so practical and I was thinking, wow, like it made sense. And, but I could take her book and then open up my big new King James Bible sitting there and I could read the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I had remember reading that Bible, not that one, but years prior being in lockup cells. And they, they ask you if you're religious, they'll give you whatever... You know, readings that if you're Christian, they'll give you a Bible. Even if you're in lockup, if you're Muslim, they'll give you the Quran. If you're Buddhist, they'll give you some Buddha teachings. They'll let you have, other than your mat and your one pair of boxers, they'll give you some religious readings in lockup. And I remember being in lockup sales. I remember I specifically did seven days one time, solitary confinement, 23 and a half hour lockdown. And I had the Bible in there. It wasn't saved. And I would try to read the Bible, and I was probably reading the Old Testament. It's probably a King James mm -hmm. version, not mm -hmm. doing myself any favors yeah. <laughs> and getting so mad because I didn't understand it. And then I remember I, I stood in that cell, this was like 06, and I asked God, just kill me. Just kill me. And I remember throwing the Bible against the wall. I remember cussing at God. I remember calling him a, just these crazy explicit names, anything I could think of just to down him, just screaming it at the cell and then telling him to kill me. Mm -hmm. And then waiting to die, and nothing happened. Then I would get even. It was almost like Lieutenant Dan on Forrest Gump. Like, yeah. is this all you got? You call this a storm? Yeah. And then I would just get angry at him. 
And so I tried to read the Bible before, but for whatever reason, that Battlefield of the Mind book just opened up the Scripture. And so I started copying the Bible. Like I remember specifically Proverbs and Second Peter in the book of James, which are really practical mm -hmm. books. Uh, and just, just reading and copying, word for word. And I was learning Scripture. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wasn't saved, but I was saved. Because Jesus said, no one comes to the Father unless he draws them. And at that point, God was starting to draw me. You know, and the Holy Spirit was wooing me in anyway. And he was making the scripture plain. And he was bringing scripture to remembrance. Because I remember in those weeks after me diving into the Bible through this book, I would be on the yard or I'd be engaging in conversations with people who are not saved. And they would say stuff. And I remember, like, hearing James' word in my, in my, in my mind. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, who can control the tongue? Yeah. You know? Don't we shouldn't we shouldn't bless God and curse our brother in the same thing? It shouldn't be these. And I remember thinking as I'm listening to these guys talk, like, whoa, like the Bible is real and it's manifesting in my. I didn't even know what the word manifested mm -hmm. means, but like it was happening in real time. Yeah. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, you know. And then I called my mom one night and I said, I think I'm going crazy. And she's like, what are you talking about? And she may have been at Evangel Temple or at First Assembly. Uh -huh. She's Pentecostal, super yeah. charismatic. Yeah. And uh, she's like, what are you talking? I was like, Mom, I think I'm going bipolar. And she's like, what are you saying? I was like, even I've done too many drugs or I've done too many days in lockup sales. She's like, honey, just tell me what you're feeling. And I was like, well, I've been reading the Bible and I can't quit thinking about the Lord and I can't quit hearing the Bible in my mind. And I said, I think I'm going crazy and I don't want to live like this. And she starts screaming in tongues and praising the <laughs> Lord. And she's like, oh my gosh, you're saved. He's got you. And I was like, I don't know what all that means. I'm just asking you to call down here and get them, the medical team to come you know, evaluate me. Thank you for tuning in to Hope, Health, and Healing. I know that as Blake shared his story, it's given you a little insight into what it looks like sometimes when Satan paints a pretty picture for us, but it takes us down a path that we wouldn't have gone down, that we would have never dreamed we would go down. And it takes us further than we wanted to go. He keeps us longer than we wanted to stay. And it costs us more than we're willing to pay. I know that at the end of this podcast, Blake gives you a little glimpse of what it looked like as he gave his heart to Christ. Join us on the next episode as Blake shares what his journey of faith has looked like and how God has redeemed everything that the enemy took from him. Be sure to like and share this podcast with your friends and family. And join us next time as Blake continues his story and how he shares how God has redeemed everything that the enemy tried to take from him.